Hello, how are you? I'm, I'm glad you sound far more lively than I will ever sound. I've just been, I just flew in from Singapore, so I'm slightly tired. Um, when you kind of see the title of Jason Pomeroy, you're probably thinking of some sort of elderly white bloke, uh, but actually, uh, yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint you all. Um, some of you will not know me from the TV series City Time Traveller because there was only two people watching it. That was myself and my mother. Um, but I will have a few clips to sort of show you because it is kind of topical. It is about various Asian tropical cities. And this has been kind of the, uh, what should I say, it's the scratch that I've been wanting to itch for a long, long time. I'm actually half Malaysian, half English. So I grew up in the UK with a back garden. This is where I learned to kind of construct a wigwam tent and learn to ride my bike. Um, and then I kind of thought when I used to go to Kuala Lumpur, quite high density, where do people actually go and play? And so this led me later on to study at Cambridge University the role of social spaces. How can we start to foster those spaces that I used to enjoy as a child? How do you start bringing those into the sky in high density urban environments? And so that's very much the subject of this sort of presentation. Just to give you a bit of an introduction as to why on earth I'm standing up here. Um, I, I founded Pomeroy Studio um, very much driven by the green agenda. It's something that I've always been passionate about. Uh, I designed the first zero carbon house in Asia in 2008, which is this building here, the Idea House. It's an R&D prototype that provides an opportunity to consider future tropical living, but today. It's the subject of a book that I wrote on zero carbon development also in 2011. Um, but what we see in the tropics is that there is this still a need for the gas-guzzling behemoth. Um, this is Trump Tower in Manila that I designed in uh, 2011. And uh, needless to say, Donald Trump wanted to talk more about power, prestige, and opulence as opposed to energy saving and water saving. So there we were waxing lyrical saying, we can be saving 25% energy, 50% water. And he said, I don't care. I want power, prestige, and opulence. So um, we had to chuckle to ourselves that actually we did manage to create an, uh, an energy saving and water saving tall building, which will be the tallest in the Philippines when completed in 2016. He just doesn't know it. Um, then this is basically a high density urban environment that we see here. Uh, Trump Tower is the building on the right hand side. Um, left hand side is Milano residences, Knightsbridge, Centuria, Gramercy residences. So over the past five years I've been developing these and unlike London whereby I'd be having to be arguing the case to various planning authorities until I am actually grey haired, um, we managed to see the construction of this. I mean Milano residences, the far left hand side, uh, started in 2009 we're already on the 50th floor. Um, Trump Tower is on the sixth floor. Gramercy Residences, the one next to Trump Tower, is already completed. So it just goes to show the, 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 the extreme uh, dedication and, and economic uh, punching uh, power of certain cities like Manila uh, that we're starting to experience in Asia. And, and this is uh, Nova Liches. It's a 50 hectare carbon zero master plan. I mean, who would have thought that uh, developing cities like Manila would want to be embracing carbon zero development. There is often the assumption that zero carbon development, whereby the energy consumption uh, is offset by the energy, uh, sorry, the, the energy consumed is actually offset by the energy produced. Who would have thought that you can actually be delivering schemes like this at a low to medium cost? So what we're demonstrating here is that we can be delivering uh, developments at the same cost as the business as usual. So um, back to sky courts and sky gardens and trying to green the urban habitat. This was a subject of a book that I wrote uh, which summarized 10 years of research. It was the itch that I finally scratched. And um, what we need to consider in terms of the tropics is something that is uh, very prevalent across that continue band that Professor Harding was mentioning earlier today. After all, what we see in our cities is the gradual eradication of the spaces that were once so intrinsic to our social interaction. The opportunity for us to go and meet and greet or go and grab a coffee. Um, what we see is that with population increase, we're seeing the gradual densification of city centres. Half of the world's population are living in inner city centres. By 2050, 9.6 billion people will be walking the face of this earth. 
And what we're seeing is that with urbanization, you're seeing the reduction of open spaces. We're seeing the removal of streets and squares. We're seeing the increasing privatization of spaces. We're basically seeing a diminishing forest in lieu of the new concrete jungle. Now, when we look at these sort of diagrams here, what we can see from 18th century Rome to 19th century Barcelona to 20th century Portland is that as we urbanize, as we see population increase, as we see inner city migration, we're seeing the gradual eroding of, of those open spaces that were once so intrinsic to our social interaction, the street and the square. Once upon a time, it was all about the outdoor room, the, you know, the, the theater of the square. But by the 20th century, you just see these road arteries that allows us to kind of jump into our car, air conditioned, and then zoom backwards and forwards. What we're losing is that sense of drama, that sense of delight, the ability to meet and greet, for us to go and have a coffee. What we see is that the uh, high-density urban environment is not just about sort of developed cities, but increasingly developing cities. Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, and Manila has seen the rise of the high-rise building. Now, what this also means is that we're seeing the eradication of urban greenery. We're seeing an eradication of open spaces to house that urban greenery. What it means is that we're seeing increase in temperatures. Urban heat island effect, which is the difference in temperature between rural areas, which are a lot greener, and then the city areas, which have lots of hard surfaces that just seem to absorb all of that heat. Now, basically, I advocate to actually go back to the past. There are many lessons that we can learn from past social spaces. The 18th century court in Paris, this is uh, uh, Hotel Cosa by uh, Antoine Le Pot. Um, it was basically an aristocratic series of townhouses that captured these spaces in front of their houses that would allow civil society to come in and socially interact. By the 19th century, you can see places like Galleria Vittorio Emanuele in Milan that provided a shortcut through the city, linking large public plazas like the Duomo and Piazza della Scala in front of the Opera House, in front of the Gothic Cathedral. That provided a means of movement, but also a means of economy, the ability to line those thoroughfares with retail. And then by the 20th century, that transformation was almost complete with these high-density urban blocks. We start to see those social spaces start stepping up onto the rooftops. This is uh, Unité d'Habitation by Le Corbusier, the father of modernism. And we can see those recreational amenities that we once found on the ground being elevated into the sky. So arguably what we're seeing is that in the 21st century, with population increase, urbanization, we're seeing the erosion of public spaces, but we're not seeing enough effort to be replenishing the loss of open space. You know, we're all stuck on our Facebooks and LinkedIn's, aren't we? We need to try and find a way of being able to replenish the space for social interaction. And we can see that in malls, in hotels, and also in sky courts. Now, what is a sky court and what is a sky garden and what is its impact in the tropics? Well, they're effectively social spaces that are at the upward echelons within high-density urban environments. They could be in the midpoint of high-rise buildings as breakout spaces, social spaces, or they can actually be on the rooftop. I want to see a show of hands here. Um, who thinks Paris, uh, eight-story Paris, is denser than 20-story Hong Kong? Paris first, please. Hong Kong. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's natural. Perceived density. When we think of density, it's about perception. Actually, Paris, Hausmann's Paris from the 19th century is actually denser than modern Hong Kong. Uh, Paris has a, uh, Paris, Hausmann's Paris, the, the boulevards and the Champs Elysees and whatever, 5.75 FAR. Hong Kong, 4.32. What it shows is that the perceived density is all up here. We can create high density environments by not necessarily going high rise. You can actually be creating high density environments by courtyard orientated development, just like we saw in Middle Eastern cities of the past, just like what we see in Houseman Paris. So we can start to challenge the perceived density of our cities by starting to erode, starting to adapt those social spaces. A bit like the linked hybrid in China, a series of interlinked buildings that gives you a high density, but fosters a means of motion through the city. 
What happens when we go high is often that we need to try and ensure that there is a greater mode of transport. If we have the freedom of movement on the ground, we should similarly have the freedom of movement in the sky. So a sky court located in the middle of a building can also be a transitional space. When you start looking at high-rise schemes like the Shard in London Bridge, you effectively have a vertical city. You have retail, you have office, you have residential, and you have hotels, all vertically stacked, one above the other, to cater for increasing urbanization. At the same time, it's an economic hedging of bets by having different uses confined on one site. The ability to transfer from different functions, just as you do on the ground, moving from office to residence, via a street, via a square, via a boulevard, we can start to see the sky court becoming the vertical square. The lift shafts, the escalators, the travelators becoming the, the vertical arcade, being able to provide a means of movement from one part of the building to another. These spaces are also social spaces, and we can see that in the pinnacle in Singapore. At the midpoint of this high-rise residential development, we can start to see that the recreational open spaces that one would have found originally on the ground have actually been elevated into the sky. You no longer have to trundle groundwards to actually go to the gym. You can just zip across and then uh, basically use the sky court as a gymnasium, as a running track, as a means of grabbing a coffee. Or you can actually go to the rooftop to get a view. When we start to incorporate greenery into these spaces, though, they actually have some wonderful benefits. Um, when we look at the National Library in Singapore by Ken Yang, we can see that they're acting as an environmental filter. Uh, one square meter of rooftop garden can actually absorb six liters of water. And when you think about flood-prone environments like Manila, all of a sudden, by greening the rooftops, it's a means of actually reducing the reliance on large, heavy drainage uh, and civil engineering works in the ground. Mayor Daly in Chicago basically advocated for 2.5 million square feet of rooftop garden, which has effectively reduced ambient temperatures by 3 degrees centigrade. So go and do the math. If you're reducing the temperature around the city by 3 degrees centigrade, think about the reduction of the running costs in terms of reducing your air conditioning bill. Okay, you've got to stick with me on this one. Sociophysiological well-being. There was this individual called Roger Ulrich, who got 20 Japanese students in a room. And he made them watch a horror movie. They were scared. And then, basically, he got them to watch a city scene. And then he me measured their heart rates. He then got them to watch another horror film. I hope it wasn't one after the other. And then he got them to watch a green scene. And then he me measured the heart rates again. What he could see was that the heart rates returned to normal far quicker by looking at greenery than a cityscape. What we're seeing increasingly is the socio-physiological benefits of greenery. That's why we see them incorporated into so many hospital environments. And in Kutek Prat in Singapore, what we see is the incorporation of greenery to absorb not only the noxious pollutants in the atmosphere, but to actually give the pleasure and delight of the patients to be healing a lot quicker than normal. Also, the income-generating possibilities. I don't really fancy swimming close to the edge of this particular building, but uh, nevertheless, some of you do. Um, you actually pay $22 to go and get a view from this building. I personally just go and get a drink and then get a view for free. Uh, but what's quite fascinating is that these are very big income-generating opportunities. The observation deck of the Marina Bay Sands actually generates about $87,000 a day. Put it another way, the Empire State Building in New York when it was completed in the 1930s, generated in one year alone two million US dollars, which was more than the entire building took in rent. People pay for a view. People like that. So it can actually be an income generating opportunity at the same time. They can also be biodiversity enhancers. And um, at this point, if possible, can you actually play? I don't know whether it's going to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Here, what we have is effectively a permeable skin on the roof and on the walls. These monsoon windows have an aluminium perforation that allows air to percolate up and into this space. The warm air rising and then being vented out of the automated louvers at the top.
at the EcoCell Park, the ramp begins its rise. So where are we now? Well, Jason, this is where the entire 1.5 kilometers of spiral green ramp begins. Yes. <laughs> Tell me a bit about the spiral ramp. Well, you know, it, it, it starts here. It spirals up clockwise yeah, okay. all the way you know, up to the roof. And below it, we have a tank that can hold 11,000 meter cube of water throughout the year. So basically, the rainwater is harvested, captured in the roof gardens, brought down here, and it can just irrigate all of the greenery, the lush flora and fauna indeed, here. Indeed, indeed. The plant gets the vitamins and water every day. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So this building, um, Solaris building in, in Singapore, is basically a continuous 1.5 kilometre uh, kilometer track that runs around the perimeter of this office building. It provides shade and shelter. It reduces the uh, solar heat gain on the facades. It also provides a biodiversity corridor, linking the green spaces on the ground to the green spaces in the sky. So um, what we can start to see is that sky courts and sky gardens have actually moved a long way from just being the simple terraces that we saw in buildings in the past. This is Charles Corio's Chang uh, Kanchan Chunga building in Mumbai. Nothing more than simple terraced extensions that provided an opportunity for people to kind of go and grab some fresh air. But increasingly in the tropics, in high-density urban environments, we're seeing the incorporation of these social spaces as environmental places that start to see the greenery extend skyward. Now, this perspective looks like a futuristic vision, but actually, it is virtually completed now. Uh, the top right-hand image was a photograph that was taken about six months ago. What we're seeing is increasingly these alternative social spaces are being incorporated into high-density urban habitats in order to provide an opportunity to foster a greater sense of community. This is a scheme that we're currently working on in Kuala Lumpur, and it's a mixed-use scheme that basically has the facades on the east and west elevations, which are getting a lot of solar heat gain, needing to have some element of environmental protection. But there's also a cultural reference here. The building's called the hijab, which is basically the veil that a Muslim woman would be wearing. And given the Islamic sensitivities in Malaysia, we wanted to try and reinterpret that. This building effectively has a veil that also provides an environmental protection. The east and west facades having a continuous green vein that runs down from the top irrigating garden that then provides a water channel to irrigate the plants as it then comes down to the ground plane. And in the middle, you have sky courts and sky gardens to separate office, residential, and retail. So what can we see of these developments? What can we see with regard to the future of, of tropical cities? What we can see is increasingly that in the tropics, it's no longer the uh, typical plate stacking exercise that one would see in the 20th century models. We're increasingly seeing that they're far more diverse. You know, it's a bit like going out and grabbing a juicy burger. You know, it's quite tasty. And you have the rich flavours from the ground starting to extend vertically into the sky. What we see is that there is an increasing reinterpretation of natural modes. Vertical, diagonal and horizontal greenery can similarly be reinterpreted in the urban environment. Ultimately, this is my vision of a 21st century tropical vertical city with increasing urbanization, with population increase, with transmigration into city centers, what we need to start to do is model the existing open spaces of that particular culture and of that particular city, a bit like how they did in 18th century Rome, and start to vertically extrapolate, capturing the qualities of those spaces, but bring them into the sky. And if the original city was a rich melange of different activities and functions and uses, how can we start to see when we start to densify our cities, a similar mix of use extending vertically, especially in environments whereby you only have a postage stamp size site. We can then start to interlink those buildings to provide an ease of movement. 
Increasingly, uh, in the first part of the 21st century, we're seeing buildings over 80 stories, which normally necessitates more than one function. The World Financial Center, Jin Mao Tower in Shanghai, we're seeing an increasing mix of use. You don't need to travel groundwards, only to zip across into another lift to go skywards again. Increasingly, we're seeing alternative modes of movement via sky bridges and skyways to interconnect not only the building, but also into the existing city and their rooftops. We can start to also think about topping up on existing structures in order to increase the density locally and also greening the rooftops. There was a wonderful comment earlier this morning about sort of agriculture and, and urban farming, and I think it's very important for us to bear in mind, as Dixon Despommier from Columbia University highlighted, that by nine by 2050, 9.2 billion people are walking the face of this earth. And so how are you going to find the food sources to feed those many more mouths? Uh, you'd need a land surface area the size of Brazil. We can't find another Brazil. So what we may have to do is consider vertical farming, urban farming, and rooftop farming. And let's celebrate our cities. Let's actually provide those observation decks once again to marvel at man's ingenuity. After all, we are in the line of development and progress. Thank you very much. I'll just leave you with these three words, distill, design, disseminate. Let's learn the lessons from the past to distill for the present and disseminate that knowledge for future generations. Thank you.